So thank you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. And oddly, even though I normally talk about public transport, I feel that today I'm compelled to talk about the kind of opposite of public transport, which is cars and roads. And uh, and the reason is that, um, so if you know anything about me, you know that um, I kind of exist on the internet because of my interest in and work on comparing the construction costs of uh, urban rail projects, um, finding that they are significantly, by a very large factor, more expensive in the United States, especially New York City, than they are in the rest of the world, especially parts of the world that are rich but do not speak English. Um, say, Southern Europe is very, is very good at this, South Korea is very good at this, Switzerland, um, Turkey, which is in many ways Southern European in this. Uh, the Nordic countries are good and used to be excellent. Um, and uh, and moreover, I claim, and I will defend this later in this video, that the reason for the limited extent of uh, positive, that is to say, toward uh, from cars and toward mass transit, model shift um, in many countries is inability to build more mass transit due to higher costs. Um, and in the United States, this means that there's, instead of a limited model shift, there is no model shift, and there's even adverse model shift. Um, and there do exist a set of critics um, then that I uh, was asked to, to address the critique of um, people who claim that it doesn't really matter um, because Nobody talks about how expensive roads are. The United States builds vast road networks despite their very high costs. Um, and I would like to address this criticism, and it's a multi-stage uh, response. So first of all, um, we're going to go over uh, actually high American road construction costs um, compared with the rest of the world as far as I can tell. Then we're going to go over how this matters. This does lead to cancellation of certain road projects in the United States. Um, then, um, because you might think, oh, it's good maybe that roads are being canceled because if you don't build roads, then people are not going to drive as much. And, that, and, and maybe if you just reduce construction costs for roads and rail, then it's a wash because... You just build more stuff for the same money, but building more stuff means people are also going to drive more. So I want to address that and talk about how there's this kind of weird pattern where um, if you reduce the construction cost of rail, you will build more rail, and you will usually build more rail in useful places. So rail will get high ridership and lead to positive model shift. Oddly, if you reduce the construction cost of roads, do you build more roads as a result? Absolutely. But, I mean, we can't exactly get a clean example because all of the examples I'm going to go into also have low rail construction costs. But there's reason to suggest, there's, I, I believe there's grounds to think that this would not lead to adverse model shift. And, and I'm going to go a lot into where the United States builds roads and what kind of the purpose of modern road building in the United States is and also where the adverse model shift that we do see in the United States comes from. The United States has adverse model shift. Can a touch and citizen's voice argument? Absolutely, yes. Of course. Um, of course, I'm gonna, uh, I have to talk about Brooks and Lesko. Um, and uh, so let me actually copy paste and uh, already uh, address this later. And also, yeah, and, and literally um, while planning this video, I saw uh, this very story in the New York Times and uh, Dana Rubinstein's, uh, Rubinstein, how did she pronounce her name? Rubinstein, Rubinstein? Um, uh, on her um, uh, Macedon account that they're uh, literally just, the, the costs are exploding and this is going to risk the project. And this is a project that probably should not happen, but um, the... But the point is that usually American road construction tends to be kind of make work, uh, and uh, like to the point of being anti-developmental in many ways. And then I kind of want to go over various road rail compromises or things that, on hindsight, we can identify as political compromises between them and what has worked and what has not worked. 
Um, so first of all, as I, so as I said, we're going to start with uh, some descriptive examples of high American road construction costs. Uh, now, the best paper on this that I have seen, um, and thanks, Arkit, for um, linking to it, is by Brooks Lisko. Um, it is called... I don't know if infrastructure cost is its final title. Um, those of us who were, who live on tw or used to live on Twitter um, saw it when it was already when it was in preliminary and complete blizzard did not circulate. There's a final version of this. It's just that this is the version that we would keep linking to. This is an internal comparison that points out that um, per kilometer cost on uh, freeways in the United States in general tripled between the 60s and the 80s, um, and uh, they uh, attribute this to something called citizen voice, aka nimbyism. Um, and I'm and now there are many reasons why one would uh, object to freeway construction, uh, not all of which are NIMBY, but I'm going to later, again, I'm going to go over various compromises between roads and uh, mass transit. Um, advocates, um, and I would argue that what has actually what, what actually transpired in this era in the United States with kind of the rise of the new left is uh, needs to be needs to be understood as nimbyism. Um, essentially, it's people not wanting highway. Maybe it's people who did not want highways in general, but they only had the political empowerment to prevent highway construction in their own neighborhoods, and these were mostly wealthy. Uh, People, um, maybe people didn't ID as wealthy, but objectively speaking, were wealthy. For example, Jane Jacobs, daughter of a doctor, uh, high school graduate, in a, um, in a generation where there was only about half, maybe slightly less than half of Americans. Uh, she didn't graduate college, but had spent a couple years at Barnard. So not just any college, but a seven. I don't actually remember if Barnard's the seven sisters. But certainly, an, an annex to an Ivy, like the women's college equivalent of an Ivy. Uh, um, she was a journalist at the time, a very high prestige profession, and her husband was an architect. So please miss me with Jane Jacobs as the voice of the working class forever and ever. Um, and uh, so, this is an internal comparison. Costs within the United States tripled over this era. Um, and um, the and, and the paper talks about how the highways have become more squiggly. This is something that other people have also uh, noticed. There, there was a uh, Texan blogger. I'm trying to remember his name. I think it's he was anonymous. I think it was maybe Purple City, um, who was talking about um, how uh, who who was given an example. And I'm going to try to look at Oklahoma, and then I'm going to give up when I um, fail to find what I was looking for. Um, where uh, this blogger would point out um, a freeway that was essentially a zigzag. I do not remember if it is this one. Um, but the idea is that freeways used to be built straight and they got squigglier, more squiggly. I bad at English grammar, it is not my native language. And... Um, their um, squig and because they got more and they got more squiggly, so this would be an example of a straight freeway, I guess. Um, although I guess if it's not an interstate number, maybe it's later. I'm not sure. Um, as I said, I'm gonna. I, I remember, I promise, I'm gonna look at Oklahoma and then fail to find this. Or maybe this is the straight example, and then I don't know what the squiggly one is. Um, where maybe newer freeways would be built like this to reduce. Uh, neighborhood impact, so they would be slower, and all, but also there would be more construction involved, um, uh, maybe through suboptimal alignments just to avoid politically powerful neighborhoods. Um, and so this paper explains it in terms of nimbyism. Um, it's not, um, but but maybe it's better to also compare with. Uh, the working class was in our. The working class are people who feel working class. So people who are, are earning, let's say, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year um, with overtime, but they're in a public sector union. Uh, they are uh, poor middle class sods and borners 
you understand that like in America, middle class does not mean what it means in in, in Britain. Um, but anyway, let's talk for a moment not just about the internal comparison over time, but about comparison over space. Now, did I delete my own article now? Um, so, I have not seen a comparison of road costs by country that tries to compare specific types of road with specific types of road. I have seen overall uh, comparison of cost per route kilometer or per lane kilometer, but maybe that lumps in rural and urban highways, it lumps in tunnels with not tunnels. Um, at one point, I wrote this article, which I want to say it's the... So when I was freelancing in 2017, this was, the I think, the second... The article that I was second proudest of, the proud, the, the one I'm proudest of is the one that I wrote for Vox. Um, it is this one. Um, and um, so this is just me slagging on Elon Musk back when he didn't own Twitter. And uh, don't read it for the slag on the boring company, which is at this point just pure vaporware. Um, but read it for the couple links that I have about uh, freeway construction costs. And it was specifically looking at tunnels. I mean, it was about tunnels. It's about idea of the boring company about what they're going what they're going to do and I'm uh, pointing out first of all that a subway kilometer generally costs less than a freeway kilometer within the same city uh, then I compare the big dig and the Alaska way viaduct the one that is uh, the one that was at the time a billion dollars per kilometer I do not know whether the costs have risen since um, and essentially I, can, I do this comparison with um, let's say, Seattle subways, and U-Link was very cheap by American standards. The only thing built in America recently that has even semi-reasonable construction costs. Unfortunately, construction costs in Seattle have exploded since um, for, for the SD4 projects, the non-SD4, SD3 projects. But um, there, uh, but th things like uh, Ballard, but um, they're still cheaper than a freeway. Um, um, now, in L.A., I don't like... So, in L.A., I don't really like doing this comparison. And the reason I don't like doing this comparison, but I'm still going to put it there because there aren't enough other examples, is that it, it, this is a cancelled tunnel. Um, now, if this is a cancelled tunnel, and this is extremely expensive, um, if you're wondering about how much this would cost outside the United States, M30 is, I believe, Europe's longest freeway tunnel. Why? Because Madrid is very good at building tunnels, so they are, in addition to uh, having built more than 100 kilometers of subway in 10 years, from 1995 to 2005, they also um, built freeway tunnels, and the same is true of Paris. Um, Berlin, I, I didn't put it in the... Uh, I didn't put this in, in the um, article because I didn't know about the tunnel then. Um, but there's also a tunnel in Berlin, a road tunnel in Berlin. Uh, uh, in uh, I think it's I want to say just west of city center, but but with that I mean either the western part of Meta or just west of Meta. I don't mean like west of the Rhine. Um, and the cost, as I remember, about the same, probably two hundred, three hundred million dollars a kilometer. Um, and uh, this is and and this was twenty years ago, so it would be. Sm sm it would be slightly more maybe than the U-Bahn tunnel in Berlin, than less than an U-Bahn tunnel in Berlin now, but the U-Bahn tunnel in Berlin now, that's 20 years of further cost increases, and also what Berlin is building now, which I mean U5, was not just west of Mitte, is literal Mitte, under Untel den Linden, under the river, they had to freeze the ground to build the stations. Um, so overall, I'm making the point that... Um, for this again, these aren't a lot of data points, um, but it appears that freeway tunnels cost a little bit more than subway tunnels do in the same city. Uh, and um, again, this is not a comparison that's in this because I uh, uh, 
didn't remember it. I'm pretty sure I knew about it, but I didn't remember. There's something called the Stockholm Ring Road. This is freeways that are around the center of... Uh, that kind of not quite delineate the um, extent of central Stockholm, but more or less. Um, like, this is a little bit outside. So, um, central Stockholm is kind of delineated by... Uh, I mean, it's where the congestion zone is, but they, they chose the congestion zone based on a uh, choke point, so so, so it includes Southern, so it includes Southern Malm, uh, Kingsholmen, and uh, the, in like this region, which is technically normal, uh, uh, technically normal and uh, Ostermal, but the division between normal and Ostermal is a little bit fuzzy because it's just contiguous. Um, I, like, I lived here, and I lived near the border between Nord and Öster, and I didn't remember which side, and I still don't, and it didn't matter very much. Um, but, um, the, so there's this freeway that mostly orbits this, um, the eastern parts have been, uh, as Wikipedia mentioned, mentions, kind of cancelled. I don't know, maybe they're going to be restarted because the, um, because of the right-wing government. Um, this is something that the, uh, the, the this is a matter of uh, um, party politics within um, Sweden. And if a okay, you know what? Instead of going uh, over this, instead of trying to follow internal links, let me try to follow from here because there's also an additional tunnel, the bypass tunnel that is being built in Stockholm um, as we speak. It is being built because. Uh, uh, it is being built because the center right was in power and they like cars and they decided that uh, this one that money from congestion pricing is going to be dated not predominantly to mass transit as the social democrats preferred but to building a road tunnel which is a 17 kilometer road tunnel uh, and uh, I, they've had cost overruns is the problem and I don't remember where they are so right now they're saying 37 billion kronor so 37 way 17 is what this is yeah this is somewhat more expensive per kilometer than uh new tunnel and um and, and the and the cost overruns there are in tandem with those of new tunnel um so stop so this is substantially lower than American road tunnel costs. Um, so you can do this kind of international comparison and obtain the same result. And this should not be too surprising because the uh, the reason why construction costs in the United States are high, um, the, the reasons um, include things like procurement. Um, and Citizen Voice, um, by the way, is something that is connected with this, and I will talk about how it relates to public transit and why this means, and, wh and what this means about construction costs and why they matter for model shift in, in a little bit. But many of these reasons apply to roads as well as trains. Um, so um, if your procurement is broken, generally it should apply to both. Now, I have heard an argument that the procurement, that the broken procurement is a bigger problem for uh, rail projects and mega projects in general than for road projects, and I need to ad and I do want to address that because I am comparing tunnel costs. Most roads are not tunnel. In the United States, um, I downloaded via the uh, um, via the um, FHWA a database of all tunnel road tunnels in the United States. Um, they sum to 719,000 feet in length, which we're going to convert to something that is not thousands of feet. It is 219 kilometers of road tunnel in the United States, in the entire United States. Um, and uh, the, the interstate network alone is either high five figures or low six figures kilometers. Um, and so even uh, and Germany, no, the US builds not a lot of tunneling relative to its uh, extent the United um, Germany in 2000 had 150 kilometers of road tunnel, so almost as much as the United States on one quarter of the population. Um, there's a website which is called Everyday Wiki or Everything Wiki. Uh, or 
for everything wiki, which has a list. It's just that the list is full of broken links. Um, if you try to look at the list of countries by um, overall tunnel length. Um, the United States is not at all the first, even in absolute numbers. Norway is ahead. Um, and uh, you know, in Italy, Greece, maybe you would say they're mountainous, but the U.S. has the Rockies and the Appalachians, all of California. Um, and so uh, this is specifically tunnels, and they want to caveat what I'm saying right now, because mega projects are different from non-mega projects. First of all, they're much more legible to the public, just because they're right there. The big dig, oh, so maybe the big dig is very infamous for its high costs outside Boston, but everyone in Boston knows the big dig. Everyone in Boston was reading about the big dig as it was being built. The big dig is big enough that politicians um, were involved, um, and so it was a matter of political embarrassment rather than an embarrassment to a middle manager in the civil service when the costs run over so much, and, um, and and the timeline was delayed so much, and this means that um, it's easier to track their costs through mass media and trade media because if the numbers are garbage, then an investigative journalist, maybe in local media, will find it out. You can actually make it a career. You can actually make a career. Um, I'm not going to say you're getting a Pulitzer for um, that, but um, you actually might. Um, my understanding is that the um, article by Brian Rosenthal about uh, the most expensive subway mile on Earth, the, about construction costs on Second Avenue subway, it didn't win a Pulitzer. But my understanding is that it was either shortlisted or longlisted for a um, Pulitzer for uh, um, local reporting. Um, the big problem is that um, in America, to get a Pulitzer for local reporting, you need to actually show that the uh, local reporting actually changed something. Um, which leads to kind of weird incentives where the newspaper has to report on its own impact. Um, there's a, there's an entire uh, subplot about that in season five of The Wire, um, where the newspaper is essentially just reporting on the impact of its own stories, which are also um, which also happen to be uh, made up, like the journalist and this being the wire, the journalist made it. Um, makes uh, made up the story it's based on a real journalist who did win a Pulitzer for the Baltimore Sun who the wire showrunner David Simon had a lot of conflict with and claims uh forged and, and, and claims faked the story the actual story was about Latin, um and the wire it's about homelessness so the point is that the numbers are likely to be highly accurate um they're hard to hide that's the first thing the second thing is that um the second thing is that uh, the numbers are likely to include just the project and not other things. There's something called betterments, which is various extras that are often bundled with the project, sometimes for legit, sometimes for illegitimate reasons. Um, maybe if you're rebuilding the street to build a streetcar, you might as well also do other things in the rebuild, let's say tree planting, pedestrianization of some streets. This um, and if you're bundling that with the cost of the project, this will lead to a significant increase in cost. And I don't mean overrun. I mean the absolute budget is just going to be higher. For example, the tramway in Nice um, was at the time when it opened. I think it was in the mid 2000s. It was the most expensive per kilometer in France outside Paris. But 30% of that cost was such betterments. Again, tree planting pedestrian plazas, street reconstruction, um, which now for light rail, it's still only 30%, so you can still do a comparison. Um, but for things that are simpler than light rail, for example, bus lanes or bike lanes, um, these betterment costs, often unreported because the project is too small to attract much attention, are going to make a very large difference. So I'm less certain about our methodology of rating mass media and even trade media for cost estimates um, for things that are not as big as a subway or a major light rail line, commuter rail tunnel. And so I'm mentioning to you things about road tunnels. I'm arguing to you that American road tunnels cost more than their European counterparts. Um, 
And I want to make it very clear that I believe this is also true for things that are not road tunnels, but it's harder to be certain. And moreover, some of the procurement problems that lead to very high construction costs underground, they, so some of them should be applicable everywhere, but not all of them, because for example, one of the procurement problem is um, improper risk management. Um, it's, in, it's improper risk, uh, improper assignment of risk. Uh, risk allocation. So if you you try to privatize risk so much, um, then the private bidders are going to respond by bidding higher. Um, if there's a contentious process for change orders, same thing. And in American mass transit construction, um, many contractors say openly that they make money on the change orders. Now, this is specifically to, this is specific to very complex projects such as urban tunneling. Now, this is likely to occur for urban rail tunneling and also urban road tunneling. Um, in fact, the Big Dig. I mean, I, I don't need to speculate because the Big Dig um, was very, again. It was very infamous. So there's a lot of very detailed work on what went wrong at every level. And one of the things that went wrong was they were tunneling. So um, the big dig for people who do not know, and if you do not know, you very much should. It's not just a Boston issue. It's a really important example of uh, mega projects. Um, I've seen people who have absolutely no connection with New England or with um, transportation cite it. So um, this part, so there used to be something called Atlantic Avenue, which had an elevated line, and then they built a, an elevated roadway um, instead, um, which was called the Central Artery. And this split the neighborhood, essentially. It split away the north end from downtown. It split the waterfront from downtown. And uh, it was also built, I think, in the 1930s. So it was built to 1930s standards, which, if you don't care about neighborhood quality of life or anything like that, still pretty bad standards. And at any rate, they were trying to tear it down and replace it with a tunnel. Um, and they ended up replacing it with a complex of tunnels. So the Central Artery Tunnel is among them. Um, they also built this tunnel um, to the airport. Um, I forget whether the part of... So this is a, t a tunnel on the turnpike. I'm forgetting whether it's part of the Big Dig or not. Um, so it was a lot... But anyway, it was a, a bunch of tunnels. And where did they tunnel? Um here in downtown Boston, in the historic core of the city, where they, they had to run into 17th century digs and, they, and, they, um, and, and was very complex geology and archaeology, and that's one of the reasons costs ran over. And, um, the, and one of the really frustrating things about the north-south railing debate in Boston, that there would be a project to build a rail tunnel to connect South Station and North Station, um, in a tunnel beneath the Big Dig tunnel, is that um, the rail tunnel would go in a known area. They cleaned up all the dirt when they built the Big Dig. So essentially all of the really difficult uh, geological work for the NSRL tunnel has already been done because of the Big Dig. But this um, extremely expensive complex of tunnels intimidate so many people that it reduced the appetite to build such things. Um, but maybe this is less relevant to um, smaller projects. Maybe um, if, it's, if you're privatizing risk for, I don't know, taking some suburban or, or intercity freeway and just adding a lane to it somewhere, maybe that's such a routine project that there's much less risk. I don't know. Then, then that might be cheaper. Um, is my point. And so, as I said, so American freeway costs, at least when tunnels are concerned, are, are a large multiple of how much they cost in continental Europe. Um, now, does it matter? As I'm pointing out with the example of the Big Dig, yeah, it does. It reduces appetite to build. It reduces appetite to build roads and mass transit. So in the case of Boston, um, it is unfortunate that the Big Dig reduces the app is reducing the appetite to build um, the NSRL tunnel because the NSRL tunnel is the same alignment, so it makes people think, oh my god, this is expensive, where actually what it means is we already did the hard work, 
this is going to be much easier. Um, so, so to be very clear, the reduction in appetite is not necessarily rational. Sometimes it's just, um, so, sometimes it's just, I don't know what to call it, emotive maybe? Um, but this is also true for um, other road projects. Um, as I mentioned in the Urbanized article, Los Angeles canceled um, a freeway tunnel uh, for, for a combination of cost and impact. Um, in Seattle, um, activists who, who opposed freeway construction warned that putting the Alaska Way viaduct um, in a tunnel would lead to extreme cost overruns. They called it the big dig of the West, and people didn't believe them, and the project is being pursued. However, the activists were correct, and thanks to the cost um, blowout on this tunnel, I don't expect the United States to do such a thing, because big dig and big dig of the West. Um, now, on the surface, another example, um, which actually one of the transit activists I know who, doesn't, who, who openly doesn't care about costs, cited it as an example of a really expensive highway, um, which is I-69. Well, it's kind of not being built. Um, and the issue with I-69, it's, it's a bunch of different issues, um, but I contend that all of them just boil down to cost. So for people who don't know the history of I-69, um, I-69 is not mostly part of the original, or, or, or I don't remember, part of the original interstate system. Um, it's an addition that the interstate the interstate system was set up, and then more things have been added to it since. Um, probably fewer than the highway builders would have liked, just because of costs as well as political changes, which I am going to go over in a little bit. Um, but I sixty nine um, in Michigan has a characteristic of kind of like a grand bypass around Detroit, so not a bypass around the city, but a bypass around the entire metro area. Um, Serving the uh, serving a bunch of secondary cities, so Port Huron, Flint, Lansing, um, and uh, Battle Creek, and and Battle Creek, and uh, this, by the way, is also a really this would also make a very good uh, rail corridor, not the literal freeway, but um, uh, there's a rail corridor parallel to the freeway that would make a pretty good intercity rail corridor. There's currently a single train a day running. They should figure out how to improve service to more modern standards. And then I-69 keeps going southwest, avoiding Chicago. Um, you can see the map here, maybe. And uh, this might be better. Uh, and it's supposed to go to Mexico, to the main U.S.-Mexico um, ports. Uh, maybe you shouldn't say ports. Uh, ports of entry, so they're inland, but, but they're crossing points between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, uh, along the Rio Grande, um, in the Rio Grande Valley. And um, as you can see, the southern parts of it have not really been built. And this is a very political story. Um, there was a lot of populism about this. The government of Texas, so when NAFTA was, so I believe this is an idea that dates to NAFTA, that there would be a freeway that would be designed to connect Mexico with Canada via the United States. And obviously it would serve America as well um, on the way, but the main purpose would be faster transit between Mexico and Canada. I mean, right now, Mexico um, to U.S. freeways, um, let's say they enter via Texas. Um, the main Texan freeways go kind of north and not to Ontario, just how the interstate system has been built. Um, and um, I'm forgetting which Texas governor it was. It may have been Rick Perry, but it may have been earlier, so it may have been when George W. Bush was the governor of Texas, I don't remember. Had this idea to bundle this into a giant program to build these excessively wide rights of way connecting the Texas Triangle cities. Um, and they say they also wanted to include railways there, either freight or passenger. They would not be very useful for passenger rail, but these are not the sort of people who know what makes passenger rail work. Um, and uh, the um and the proposal and this proposal was next because it was so extravagant that the costs were very high but also um there was a lot of um political populism what we today would identify as right-wing populism against it but the american prospect um which has a very protectionist line backed it 
Um, back this line, um, people complained that the NAFTA superhighway would eliminate American sovereignty. Like, I think there were at one point plans to have a, uh, to to have like an inland port of entry, like some way for Mexican trucks to clear U.S. customs not at the border but farther inland. I think maybe maybe even as far north as Kansas City on like I thirty five, um, and so there was a lot of political populism that portrayed this highway specifically as a violation of American sovereignty um, by people who probably all voted for Donald Trump in the primary in 2016, but this was the 1990s, early 2000s, before the kind of populism politicized, when, it, again, it existed, but it was a bunch of French people in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party. Um, and... Um, so, and again, the, the main reason I-69 is not being built is costs, but the political popul and, and but the political populism is there as well. Now, I contend that the political populism is kind of allowed to exist when there are other reasons for it to exist. So in this case, the other reasons are cost. Um, in the same way that, for example, California high-speed rail is not being built because of excessive costs. However, um, there are NIMBYs who like to claim credit for derailing it, except that had costs been more reasonable, the NIMBYs would have been ignored. In fact, when the NIMBYs tried to do things formally through a lawsuit, they lost. It's just that the, the, the money that the state has is insufficient to build the system that it promised to build. And so, and then it's the same, I believe, with I-69. So high costs do actually lead to project cancellations, often, um, again, bundled with people who oppose the project for other reasons. Costs are not everything. Costs swing from one thing to another. Um, in, in Maybe in the same way I was talking about Trump before, um, most people who voted Donald Trump in 2016 voted Mitt Romney in 2012, McCain in 08, Bush in 04, and 2000. Um, I'm not saying everyone is a consistent partisan in the United States, let alone in the UK or actual multi-party system, but people do tend to be pretty consistent. Um, so nearly everyone who voted for, for, let's say, Trump is a consistent partisan, stayed with Trump in the election that he lost four years later, um, had voted Republican in the elections the Republicans lost four and eight years before. Um, and... Um, Often these people, these specific consistent partisans, uh, were profiled as Trump supporters who are still with Trump. But um, what mattered was Obama-Trump voters, um, and what mattered was then Trump-Biden voters um, for four years later. Now, the, now, elections are decided on the basis of very small swings, um, and... The cost issue is, and maybe the decision, the yes/no decision, is a much bigger swing, but it's kind of the same thing. So the sort of people, so the loudest voices in, let's say, the Trump era and the post-Trump era Republican Party are consistent partisans. But what swings the election is not what they think; it's what people who are not who aren't consistent partisans think. And likewise, the loudest voices against the NAFTA superhighway were the people calling it the NAFTA superhighway and. Um, making up conspiracy theories about how it was a globalist conspiracy uh, to um, reduce American sovereignty, but what actually swung it was that the project cost too much, and specifically the Texan plans to build um, these excessively wide corridors, they, would, they just didn't pass cost-benefit analysis. So this is something that absolutely does happen, um, not just for tunnels, but even on the surface. There are highways that the U.S. cannot build because it costs too much to build them. Um, so people do care about costs. Um, now, if, like me, you're ma mainly thinking about public transportation, this is not something that you think about very much. Why would I think about highway costs very much? I focus on public transportation, not on highways. In the same way that I might know some things about how much it costs to fund schools, how much it costs to fund healthcare, um, how much it costs to fund a military that... Uh, has machine guns rather than broomsticks. And if you think I am kidding. This is the army of the country that I live in. 
and to be very clear, this army is about the same size as the French army. Like, the German military spending is low, but it's not zero. Um, so, uh, I might know a few things about these things, but this is not my primary focus. It is not, and in general, it is not the primary focus of public transportation activists, which is how they can say things like, oh, nobody cares about military costs. Yes, they do. Projects that, can, projects that get canceled all the time. Yes, there are big military projects that cost insane amounts of money um, and are still allowed to go through. Or maybe they cite the great amounts of money. In, in the United States, it's the F-35 program. Um, they say that it's, I think, $1.4 trillion dollars. But it's $1.4 trillion over the cost of the entire program, which is, so it's not just development, it's also buying the planes and then uh, operating the planes over several generations. I believe it's supposed to be, oh, $1.7 trillion. And uh, this is, I guess, with additional overruns, uh, but yeah, but this is total lifetime costs. Um, so it's maybe 1.5 trillion, that's a an actually pretty hefty share of the American spending on the Air Force over a program that is like 60 years. Um, and um, likewise, and, and, and I know this about like land army stuff, I mean, the futuristic like tank designs, they constantly get canceled. Um, likewise with highways, it's very easy if, like me, you're mostly talking about trains to say, oh yeah, they don't care about highway construction costs, but they absolutely do. Um, and there was something that a bunch of public transportation activists noticed in, uh, I think it was in the Obama stimulus era, that um, they picked up some car magazines, um, I think like, uh, was it Jalopnik? Um, where... Um, uh, that we're talking about how the United States was spending too much on road construction, not enough on maintenance, and this led to very poor uh, condition for roads. Um, so even highway people were okay with moving away from road construction. The, the current system in the United States is that um, uh, road money, um, or rather money that is lockboxed to roads, like fuel taxes, uh, usually, it certainly historically was always the case, I think it might still be, money was only allowed to be spent on road construction, maintenance was supposed to come from somewhere else. Um, and this did lead to under-maintenance, and quite a lot of the state of good repair uh, advocacy uh, takes that into account. So as, so, I, I video, so I vlogged about this, I think a year and a half ago already, um, about how state of good repair has been pretty awful for public transit, like it essentially turns maintenance into a black hole. But um, into a black hole in which money just disappears and things never get better. Um, I'm not going to say this is actually something that they should be doing for roads because I'm less familiar with like the political economy of road construction. But it's something that has precedent with roads where you literally see shiny stuff being built to excerpts where nobody lives while the core network is literally falling apart. Um, the, America, the, the condition of American roads is not very good. Um, and um, and again, it's something that if you again if you read highway magazines, which I don't because that's not my main interest, but sometimes I, I see them, and they talk about that. Um, so are American road costs elevated? Yes, they are. Um, does it matter? Yes, there are roads that are not being built because of that. Um, so now let's talk about model shift and adverse model shift because there are people in my uh, Macedon at replies who are asking, wait, why do I care that roads are not being built? I mean, you don't care, I don't care either, but more importantly, um, maybe it's actually good that roads are not being built, because if you build roads, then people are going to switch to roads for, from trains. That's adverse model shift, people switching to roads, right? Well, no. I mean, it's a, I mean, adverse model shift exists. I just disbelieve that making it easier to build infrastructure would do that. Now, part of it is proof of pudding. The United States has very high construction costs and actually does have adverse model shift. Um, and then you have Norway with its millions of um, road tunnels to all these little islands. 
Um, and Norway has way better public transport ridership than the United States. Um, or, or Sweden, same thing. I, I showed you the example of the 17-kilometer freeway. Maybe it's not open yet, um, so you can reserve judgment. But Sweden also opened the uh, sections of the ring um, roadway before, uh, just before congestion pricing. Um, so Sweden, I think, has like eight or nine kilometers of road tunnels in operation. Um, uh, I think it's the western and southern parts. Uh, of this ring, and Stockholm has high model split for public transport. Right? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you can bypass. You can drive more easily and bypass this. There, are, um, you can. There's literally a freeway tunnel here um, that you can uh, go. You can go directly under Södermalm. Um, they demolished sections of Gamla Stan to build this. This is like literally a medieval city center with a freeway through it. I mean, on its side, but still. And then drive to your um, parliamentary job um, right in uh, city center um, and park underground. The model split for all trips in Stockholm County is about 40% mass transit and a hefty proportion, in addition, I do not remember how hefty, for uh, um, bikes and pets. So, uh, very high use of mass transit. Uh, I think that this is the blog post where I linked to it. Um, this is the this is before some of the cost overrun, so this is much more optimistic than what I would say three and a half years later. Uh, so this is what I was looking for. This is a bunch of papers at once, but the first, uh, and most of them are not about this, but um, by the way, Maria Perriasson is a very good researcher. I recommend reading everything that she writes. This is uh, the, um, these are gonna be model splits. So uh, let me, remove my face so that you can see the entire thing for a sec. Um, total trips within Stockholm County is, okay, sorry, 32% public transit, 38% per, car, 25% bike and ped. This is all trips with, within uh, Stockholm County. Um, the model split for, so usually I know the work trip model split. Usually for work trip, you should just assume that the, these two, bike and walk, are much lower. Public transit is much higher, and cars usually stay the same. Thirty-eight percent for cars is amazingly low. Um, I think I think Ile de France for work trips is forty-four percent train, forty-four uh, percent mass transit, forty-four percent or forty-two percent roads, and the rest. I, I think motorcycles are, se are a separate item, maybe two or three percent or something, and then bike pad. Uh, Metro New York, the this which would be again it's thirty-eight percent. All trips in Stockholm County, probably the same for work trips. In New York, for work trips, it's about 50%. So Stockholm, with its casual use of uh, freeway bypass tunnels, has, like, I mean, yeah, there are freeway bypass tunnels. It makes driving more convenient. But it's even more convenient to take the train. And I kind of want to talk for a moment about where the roads are being built and where the trains are being built, because this matters. Um, railways pretty much everywhere are an urban form of public transportation. Um, buses are essentially in the gaps between trains. Um, literally same country, same policy. I mean, where do people use trains the most or use public transportation the most in Sweden? In Stockholm. In Switzerland, which um, is kind of famous for how good its um, rural rail coverage is, you can take a train up to a ski resort um, and all the connections are timed, so it's not just about connections between Thierry and uh, and Geneva or Thierry and Basel, and but also um, things between two small secondary cities, like trying to get between I don't know uh, I don't know Saint Gallen and uh, Bien, um, and and you're gonna get uh, and you can go via Thierry, and there's gonna be a time transfer, things like that. In Sw in Switzerland as well. The highest use of public transportation is in is in the canton of Zurich, especially within the city. Um, 
so again, same country, same policy, even a country where there's an unusually small... Switzerland does have an unusually small gradient um, in public transport usage um, as you leave Ciri, as you leave the canton of Ciri, um, but there's still a gradient. Um, now, in, a, in another place, the gradient might be much greater, for example, in France. Uh, Paris has much higher public transport usage than Zurich. Um, I believe the model split in Zurich is 30%. In Paris, it's, as I said, about 44%. Paris is also a much bigger city. Nowhere in France with the Zurich-sized city do they have Zurich's model split. They wish. Um, and then there's a very sharp drop-off as you leave Ile-de-France. And so, uh, in the same way, um, where do um, these big railway construction programs, what do, where do they go? They help you work in city center. Um, Zurich has a pretty strong city center, thank you very much. It's not a high-rise city center. This is Europe, not America. But the city center, over not a few blocks of high-rise, but over a larger uh, expanse and with maybe some sub-centers all within the, the broader center, has a lot of jobs. People who live in the suburbs of Zurich vote for um, the Swiss People's Party because they uh, hate um, Muslims and uh, prefer cars. The SVP is, SVP is a pro-car party. Um, they take the S-Bahn into, Zurich, in, into city center in Zurich. Let me, let me get my video back. And the same is true in Munich, okay? Munich, like Zurich and like American cities, has very contentious city-suburb politics. The city is much more left-wing than its suburbs. The city has been run by SPD and now the Greens. Either its entire post-war existence or almost its entire post-war existence. State, the state has been run by CSU, I believe, in its entire post-war existence. Um, often with CSU having absolute majorities and not even needing a coalition. Um, the suburbs of Munich generally vote says, ooh, they hate the city. They used to hate the city because it was left-wing, then because it's queer, now because it is racially diverse. They ride the S-Bahn to work, because, the, because um, not because they have not built freeways. This is Bavaria we're talking about. They build freeways. Um, but because there's really good rail transportation on um, to city center, and over um, and and because of supporting land use, in this case, it would mean that they built the freeways. Maybe they, they built the motorways, maybe without demolishing the entire city. The United States did demolish. One of the reasons the United States under tunnels is that the United States just demolished black neighborhoods. Um, whereas um, this hasn't happened nearly as much in Europe. It has happened to some extent. They were not black neighborhoods. They were maybe. Uh, um, inner city working class neighborhoods, but um, there has been a lot less of that. Um, city center has become, has stayed more intact, um, and uh, there has been much less deurbanization of jobs. Um, so all these people who hate the city vote says oh, would vote AfD if AfD could shut the hell up about their Holocaust denial and just stick to um, complaining that uh, Germany is giving too much money to lazy Southern Europeans. I mean, lazy Southern Europeans who have work longer hours than Germans and build infrastructure at one third the cost of Germany, maybe one half. But go explain that to these kinds of people that um, Southern Europe isn't lazy. Um, these people, um, Take the S bun to city center to their city center jobs, um, and again, this is maybe not with uh, maybe not with a lot of um, uh, high rises, um, just high job density in a in a broader zone. But the, M Munich is specifically a very monocentric city, um, as is Stockholm. Stockholm does have Schista, uh, where they have uh, some suburban high rises, but even. But even when you throw away Shista, the city center of Stockholm has a very large share of area jobs. Um, and why is that? Because, be, well, because historically, this is what the city was, right? I mean, historically, nobody lived, I don't know, here. Here, it was undeveloped. This developed because of access to here. So historically, people lived and worked here. Um, the residents move out first, then the jobs follow. 
This is how suburbanization always works. Residence first. Suburbanization of jobs, usually not so much in Chista, but in La Défense outside Paris or um, um, with westward drift of jobs, not to a completely different place, but like to a near center place in London, so that would be Westminster, uh, or Paris, that would be to the opera from um, the original Le Halle. Um, that's often rich people move somewhere, then high end retail moves there, then the jobs follow the high end retail. Um, that, that's the that's usually the sequence, um, and then because the jobs there, uh, um, because the jobs go, um, if you can develop, then uh, poorer people will want to live nearby, um, and uh, so the sequence of this is the sequence of suburbanization of jobs. Um, in America, what happens was in the early twentieth century. Um, the upper middle class starts deserting the cities because the cities are full of Jews and Italians. Um, and then uh, they get to their city center jobs on commuter trains, which are very exclusionary, high fares, for example. And um, then uh, these people also get cars. Um, it's 1910s, early 20s. The car cars are no longer a luxury product like having a large diamond. They're a luxury product like having a diamond ring. I mean, I, I imagine. Mo I, I mean, I I wouldn't know because I don't know how much diamond ring costs. But at least my my impression is that um, rings with gemstones in them are very widespread. I mean, if you're not very rich, you might spend a couple hundred dollars on like your wedding ring. If you're very rich, you'll spend tens of thousands. Um, but it's not something very rare. Um, it's not the tens of thousands of dollars on a diamond. It's more like hundreds of dollars, and um, the uh, and, and they drive everywhere. And it's really convenient to drive if you're like the first or the tenth person who's moved from New York City to Connecticut. Um, and if you're in Darien, you also pass laws forbidding black people from living in the area. Uh, and uh, so you will drive everywhere. You will back more road construction to make this more convenient for you. You will still take the train to New York. Um, but maybe the train stops existing and then you drive. Um, or maybe you just start uh, driving to more and more and more places. Um, and more and more people get into the suburb as it develops, as um, it acquires a good reputation, as more people get to afford a car. I mentioned adverse model shift, right? There is such a thing, and um, and I do want to blame it on car infrastructure, but it also is to some extent just a matter of higher incomes, because um, in, in a situation where people ride mass transit out of poverty, as they get less poor, they will buy cars. Now, in a place that's fully inverted, I'm not even sure it's New York, but maybe Paris, um, it's unlikely to happen organically, and the reason is that Paris is uh, Paris does have people who wish they could drive and only get a car, and sorry, and only don't get a car because they can't afford it. But Paris has such good um, um, mass transit through the metro and the RER that um, I believe that the ma that a very large majority of Parisians who do not drive do so by choice. Um, or even if they're poor, they're going to keep that choice even as they get less poor. And um, so in a place like Paris, maybe adverse model share, uh, adverse, not model share, adverse model shift is unlikely. And maybe it's also true in Stockholm, but certainly in a, in 20th century America, the trains weren't good. Um, I mean, maybe parts of the subway were, but um, commuter trains were only like a rush hour. And... and uh, and they weren't useful except to get into Manhattan jobs. And um, the streetcars were really crowded. Um, the, the kind of modern mass transit quality that we're used to um, didn't exist then. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of high ridership, and the quality wasn't awful, but people who could afford to avoid it, often, uh, most of them did. To, to, the, to the point that there is adverse model shift, it's still like... There are still echoes of this adverse model shift as people get richer and they get cars in the absence of intervention. So in Los, Los Angeles, is actually a really good example. Los Angeles built its last new freeway. Um, it's the um, 
it's the Century Freeway. It's where the uh, it's the it's the 105. Uh, this was the last freeway it built, and it um, this is I think 30 35 years ago, um, and um, subsequent and essentially um, these citizen voice groups um, for a combination of NIMBY reasons um, and environmentalist reasons and urbanist reasons they um, sued the government so much that first of all you can see that this is a very it's kind of it's a weird squiggly alignment instead of just being straight along some material but also more importantly they um they, they were forced to include uh the green line of the uh, of the los angeles metro rail in the median um the green line has very little ridership because um the sort of people who advocated for it maybe are not the sort of people who take mass transit very much this being la you only ever take mass transit that much if you're very poor. Um, I remember in LA, public transit commuters um, in let's say the mid 2010s, which is when I last saw the data, um, or maybe the late 2010s, but anyway, before Corona, had barely half the average income of car commuters. Now, the relative ratios were improving. Um, in all of them, all over America, wherever I look, um, the mass trans the there's a stable on the that on the US census called means of transportation to work by selected characteristics. This one, just poke around. It will show you things like average income for but by geography for drivers, carpoolers, and mass transit commuters. Um, now commuters are not users. Um, quite a lot of wealthy people who use public transit to commute own cars, drive them everywhere except to work. Um, for example, in those rich suburbs of New York, but um, um, or often in outer New York neighborhoods, but um, it it will show you a taste where, and you can even see a trend. I think goes going back to maybe two thousand six or something, where the relative incomes of um, transit commuters have been improving, have been increasing, um, all over the United States. In some places, they've even overtaken those of drivers. Um, remember, I, I talked about cities and city centers. Train um, Mass transit in general is the best at getting you to city center. Los Angeles, the metropolitan area, um, in the um, narrower sense, so that would be just LA County um, and Orange County, so without the Inland Empire. I think the model split at this point is 4.5%, and it's decreasing. I mean, sorry, 4.5% before Corona. Um, and we'll get into Corona in a moment. This is also a really important example of adverse model shift. But the um, model shift in, in Los Angeles was negative beforehand. Why? Because LA is so poor that even if, yeah, it maybe adds a lane from time to time at extreme costs, um, let's say to, um, to the 405, but it hasn't built a new freeway in a generation. Um, again, it got sued to the point that with all the required mitigations and betterments, the construction costs were too high. Um, and they built the Green Line, which again has very little ridership. It's supposed to connect the airport with the Norwalk commuter train station, but it doesn't actually get to either of them. It, it's, it, so it gets you from almost Norwalk to almost the airport. Um, now it does get you to the job cluster at El Segundo, but okay, it gets you to the job cluster from El Segundo, but to, to El Segundo, but from where? From here? From a few areas here, the frequencies aren't good enough for a lot of transfer volumes. Um, also, you're in the median of a freeway for the same reasons freeway are awful as urbanism. They're also awful as um, urban rail alignment. Nobody wants to wait near them. So, uh, so, so despite this, there has been adverse model shift. Um, whenever they increase the fares, they see an adverse model shift in LA. Um, California passed uh, a, 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 I forget whether it was a law or a lawsuit, but California um, said that illegal immigrants can get driver's licenses. And apparently such a large proportion of LA transit users were people who were not allowed to get driver's license because of immigration status, that you could literally see that in an adverse model shift. Um, gentrification has actually had some adverse effect on uh, LA mass transit ridership, which is bonkers. In New York, gentrifying neighborhoods see an increase in subway usage. Um, for example, along the L train, um, and I'm not going to show you the uh, data viz. You can just search New York subway station ridership by year or something. 
but in New York, um, there are a bunch of places that are gentrifying, some with, some without displacement. And actually, the L train is a good example of gentrification with actual displacement. Like, you actually see black people being replaced by white people in Bushwick and then moving away to poor, worse job access neighborhoods. Um, this is not actually that common with gentrification. Usually what, ha what happens is, um, let's say, a white ethnic group assimilates to white America. Let's say Greeks in Astoria, Jews on the Upper West Side, Poles in Williamsburg and Greenpoint. Um, these people become normie white Americans and move to where normie white Americans live, that is, the suburbs. Um, and then they're replaced by other normie white Americans, uh, often from the suburbs. And essentially everyone's lives improves from the move. But then maybe small bi ethnic small businesses that cater to the community suffer because they are kind of always the last to leave. Um, but that is not actual displacement. When, when people get more money and then move to a, a rich suburb. The displacement is when people, and again, this is not that common, but Bush, but it's getting more common, I believe, relative to, let's say, 30 years ago. Bushwick is an example of this. Um, again, black, poor black people can no longer afford rent because um, richer, often white people are outbidding them, and therefore they move to way farther out places, sometimes even out of the region entirely, maybe to Atlanta. And... Um, so anyway, in along the L train, you can literally see that gentrification is increasing ridership on the subway. Why? Because maybe it's more people coming in. Um, also, importantly, remember, the best use case for public transportation is to get to city center. That's where public transportation works. Um, in a place like Munich or Stockholm or Zurich, um, the historically strong city center remained strong because of the construction of a really high-efficiency um, urban rail network. In Zurich, it was um, the S-Bahn and the retention of the streetcars. In Stockholm, they removed the streetcars but built a really good subway system. In Munich, it was a little bit of both. Um, and um, maybe in New York, they already had that system before World War II. In places that didn't, city center lost value. Um, now, um, city center... Um, the middle class is likelier to commute to city center than the working class. Um, it's a difference of degree and not kind, but um, in New York City, do rich and poor work in different areas, pedestrian observations. Um, this is the name of the blog post. Um, and um, you can actually, see, and I'm giving, I'm not giving you a link to the exact data because it's from the on the map data viz, but you can trace this and see that um, the, let, let me see if I can find the exact numbers for you, which I think I did mention. This, 57% uh, of New York City jobs that pay at least $40,000 a year are in the Manhattan core, only 37% of lower income jobs are. Um, and so, um, if you have a lot of people who um, are middle class, maybe could afford a car, but choose to forego one because of the existence of a strong mass transit network, then gentrification brings these people replacing um, poorer people who probably ride the trains out of poverty, but also small business people serving those poor people who earn more and drive, and this leads to an increase in transit ridership. We see this in New York and San Francisco. In LA, that effect does not exist, because in LA, transit is too weak, so the gentrifiers drive. Um, and even then, in LA, I believe about 50% of people who work in downtown LA take um, either a bus or a train to work, or did before Corona. Um, it's just downtown LA is very weak. Because down, because LA suburbanized early. LA was an auto culture very early, already in the 1920s. So they delayed building a good mass transit network until it was too late. What they had before the with the war, the um, red cars and the yellow cars. The red cars, um, first of all, they were street cars. They um, and second, um, especially the the red cars. The red cars were a loss leader for property development. Um, they were not ever intended to be a long term mass transit system. Um, as opposed, and 
as opposed to, let's say, the situation in Stockholm, where, yeah, they're subsidizing the subway system, but they always knew they were going to do that. Um, so the adverse model shift, does it come from building more roads? Yes, but it also comes from other things, like the de-urbanization of job geography was the most important thing in the United States. Um, also, once city center is just kind of weak, um, as people, if you have a lot, if you have a lot of transit ridership out of poverty, then as people get less poor, they will stop riding, and um, they will switch to the car. Um, if city center weakens further, then there will be adverse model shift. I, I promised I'd mention Corona. This is Corona. Um, not just in the United States, but in the United Kingdom is also a really good example. And the reason is that in the United Kingdom. Um, the census happens to be done um, whenever the year is one month uh, ten. So, um, commuting England Wales twenty twenty one. The uh, why are you showing me this? Uh, maybe commuting is not a good. Okay, so. Understanding commuting pattern from census. Um, let me see if I can, if this post will have the exact numbers. Kindly don't give me cookies. I already have cookies at home and they taste better. Um, census snapshot. So there was a large increase in working from home. Uh, travel to work. England and Wales census twenty twenty one. Um, so 31% worked from home. Uh, so, uh, we're dividing everything by 68.8%. And I never remember what they say, whether they say mass transport or public transport in British English, which means I can't just search. Um... Okay, so let's just add all of these public transport systems, and remember we need to divide by 68.8%, so train 1.9. Underground, metro, light rail, or tram. Uh, bus, minivan, or coach. So 11.5%. In 2011, I believe the number was 15%. So working from home led to adverse model shift among people not working from home. Um, in the United States, car traffic is um, car traffic was back to pre-corona levels pretty early, like I think by maybe the second half of 2020, uh, and now it's above pre-corona levels. In contrast, uh, mass transit usage is still well below pre-corona levels. In New York, it's about two thirds, and um, the um, yeah, and it, it's so bad that. Um, Fuel prices were very high earlier this year um, due to the war in Ukraine. Sorry, special military operation that was supposed to take three days. Um, time, uh, the pace of life is maybe a little bit slower in, in poorer parts of the world like the Kremlin, uh, where nobody earns any money, uh, at least not through work. And uh, the... And this contrasts with the situation in 2008, because in 2008, there was a fuel crisis in the world as well. Fuel prices were very high. Uh, food prices were very high. And um, in the United States, this did lead to an increase in public transportation usage. Um, and quite a lot of American public transport advocacy among my generation, millennials, in, 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 among Americans, specifically is a response to the combo of fuel price increases in the 2000. Um, sometimes due to, partly due to Iraq, partly due to Katrina, partly due to the 2008 fuel crisis, um, and then followed by the Obama stimulus when I mean, prices did crash with their, um, as the recession came. Um, but there was kind of this belief that as soon as, um, as jobs came back, so would high fuel prices. Um, and there was a notable model shift from high fuel prices. Um, just as there's adverse model shift from low fuel prices. And the thing is that this year, no such model shift existed. There was no, there were no stories about people buying smaller cars um, or trying to go hybrid or electric, not in the United States. Um, the electric vehicle market remains very small. Um, instead, they just complained and kept buying very large cars. And 
Um, so the issue of the, so the adverse model split again it's related to roads but it comes from but it comes even in places that don't build roads very much. Um, it comes from other reasons. Now the United States does build roads; it just builds them inefficiently and in the wrong place. And um, so, is there adverse model shift caused by American transportation policy? Yes, but it's much more failure to build urban transit where there is a lot of demand for. I mean, before Corona, there was a lot of demand for office space in New York, in downtown San Francisco, in Boston. Boston might actually come back faster just because a lot of biotech is there. Um, and for example, Moderna is not in the suburbs. Moderna is based in Cambridge. Um, and when I say Cambridge, I don't even mean Alewife. I believe they're based in Kendall Square. Um, so, um, so over time, these will grow, um, or the demand for these will grow, whether more will be built and whether adequate, um, transport there will be built. Well, we'll see, but that depends on the American ability, on the ability of America to de-Americanize its infrastructure construction costs, even if it means that some more roads are going to be built. Um, because what roads are being built in America right now? The answer is not the sort of roads that would lead to adverse model shift. Why? Because where would roads lead to adverse model shift? Um, to some extent, in a city center. So if you were to build the Lower Manhattan Expressway, yeah, more people are going to drive. Um, absolutely. And it's going to be a bad thing. Um, although I'm pretty sure that the effect uh, is going to be worse just through the, like, the displacement of like a lot of... Um, of the West Village, or of Greenwich Village and so on. Um, and um, the, um, and so this is part of what's going to happen, but also roads in very high demand suburbs. This is where Arpit asked me earlier on about the turnpike extension. This is where we need to talk about this. This is something that is not likely to make the difference between a transit city and a car city, but is going to lead to some adverse model shift. Probably not toward the city. The thing is, New York has a million other constraints. This is the main issue. Um, traffic engineers keep thinking that if they eliminate one more constraint, they're going to finally solve traffic in the city. So you knock down another building to build a parking garage, and another, and a third. And it doesn't work because there are all these urbanists that will show you how much parking you would need to build to accommodate um, all people who commute into the Manhattan core if they all came by car and approximately the size of the entire Manhattan core or something. Um, essentially, the only way to do this is just to eliminate the city. And if you don't need the city, why would you even bother working here? There are already places where the city no longer exists, maybe because there was never a city. Maybe it's in this, maybe it's suburban job, uh, you know, sub suburban jobs, um, office parks. Maybe it's a secondary city that can be more easily demolished. Maybe, uh, so, so, I, so it's mostly Jersey City that's at risk, essentially because Jersey City is now re-urbanizing around the waterfront. So again, residents move. In this case, it's along the waterfront for access to Manhattan, and then maybe jobs follow. And the trick is to make sure that there isn't going to be adverse model shift from people that the jobs are being built here are going to be accessible by mass transit. And yeah, the highway is going to make that worse. But you know what is also going to make that worse? not building good trains. Um, the, the fact that PATH runs every half hour on weekends, um, uh, or, or that uh, the Hudson Bergen light rail, same thing, um, that is at least as bad. Um, so we're in places where, and now in places where there's no mass transit, where can you have adverse model shift, by which I mean more driving from building more highways? Texas, right? I mean, when we think about when we think about growing auto-oriented places, where do we think about in in an American context? Probably we're thinking about Texas, Florida, uh, maybe Phoenix, Vegas, Atlanta, and well, look, um, Atlanta has kind of an underbuilt freeway network for its size. This is because the state government um, is run by white racists who loathe the black city. Um, they underfund the city on everything. They underfund the city on mass transit. This is why MARTA is, I believe, the only uh, American urban rail network that receives no state subsidies, only local ones, um, and some federal funding, maybe. 
for not for operations but for uh, capital, but no state operating support. Um, but these are people who hate the city. Yeah, they also hate, maybe hate trains, but they hate the city. Um, a black person who drives is still black. Atlanta today has about a, I believe, four percent maybe public transportation model split, and yeah, it's higher for black people than for white people, but like the vast majority of black Atlanta drives. The white state underbuilds freeways to black people. Um, in the same manner that, um, by, by the way, it was um, when America started building urban freeways, it was the urban interests that wanted them. Previously, um, roads were only allowed to be built outside cities. Um, so it was urban subsidies because fuel taxes were being collected from all roads, even if they had no state or federal funding, and then they were being only spent, and that money was being spent on roads outside the cities. Um, so Atlanta, um, yeah, you could build freeways there and induce more driving. It essentially, would induce even more people to move there and drive, uh, and forestall the formation of a central business district, which Atlanta does have. It's just very small relative to the city's overall size. Uh, now, Dallas and Houston have much more of a freeway network. Um, the state does not hate them. Dallas, you can check. You can compare this with Atlanta. Dallas is, as a, as a metro area, slightly larger than Atlanta, and just compare how few trunks are through Atlanta with how many there are through Dallas and Fort Worth and between them. Um, and uh, I believe Dallas and Houston individually each has more four-level stack interchanges than does the entire United Kingdom. So the United States does actually build really fancy freeway infrastructure, but it's fancy freeway infrastructure that's extremely land intensive. You use it when there's not much the, the, when there's not much city. You'd use it when land is essentially free, which it was in American history, and Americans are maybe still used to that, but when you're trying to build a this is a four level, I believe, stack interchange. Really expensive to build um just try to measure the extent of this monstrosity. Um, on the shorter side, it's 300 something meters. On the longer diagonal, it's 700 meters. Yeah. Um, no. Um, so Texas does build freeways. It expands freeways. There was complete consensus in the state to build freeways. Uh, it's freight. It's freight right now. Houston is sufficiently left wing at this point that they're suing the state, saying that it's. Um, uh, I'm forgetting whether that it's environmentally hazardous or racist to build uh, freeways, um, which is and, and now the state is going to essentially have to build freeways at higher costs because it's just a bunch of um, bureaucratic bullshit that the state never bothered about because nobody wanted to sue. Um, that's how informal this whole thing is, but. Um, so they do build, and this does induce more people to move to Texas and drive. And yet, remember how I said that the United States has these uh, lockboxes, like um, uh, fuel tax money is supposed to only be spent on road construction? Well, there is a, uh, a there is a clause there that says that the fuel tax money mostly has to stay in the same state that it uh, is generated in. Um, each state must uh, spend the amount of spending within each state must be at a minimum 92% of gas tax receipts from that state. Um, generally, um, the South has, I, I believe, a lower share than the North, which is, I think has to uh, be about, uh, I think, snow, but uh, just cold climate makes things harder to build. But at the end of the day, the state with the most auto-oriented growth, the one where you expect to see the most targeting of road spending, that is Texas. And Texas is, at the 90, is I believe, the only state at the 92% limit. Texas is the state that subsidizes the rest of the country on gas tax revenue. I mean, gas tax revenue does not ever pay for itself. It's like, I mean, it, um, essentially it's people driving on all roads, subsidizing only federally funded roads or state funded roads. But there's no attempt to focus spending on Texas. On the contrary, where is spending being focused? In depopulating parts of the Rust Belt, upstate New York, maybe. Um, less so now when um, there's enough progressive people that just don't want ferries anymore. 
Um, but in places that are rust built and very conservative, like Ohio, Ohio um, Streetslog is full of these stories that they're building, that they're upgrading interchanges around towns where there's no traffic. Uh, there's never going to be any traffic. These towns are depopulating. Um, maybe yeah, it's going to maybe it's going to save drivers half a minute. But who cares? That's not adverse model shift. That's make work. Now, I said at the beginning that often the causes of high road construction costs and high rail construction costs are the same. The make work is actually a really good example of this. Um, this is something that we call in the transit cost project the dual mandate. The dual mandate is that um, projects are sold not just based on their benefits as completed pieces of infrastructure, but also for but also as job creation. And once you sell something as job creation, you essentially give everyone license to demand more because the cost is part of the point. Um, and uh, as a result, the United States doesn't get very good infrastructure. And so with trains, this is seen as um, kind of ridiculous demands, like overbuilt stations, because jobs, um, or better events, uh, because again, jobs. With cars, the, there are part, this is part of it, but there's also, and I guess it's also a true for public transit, it's something that I call leakage, which is essentially when you're building the wrong project. Um, I've been slagging on LA a lot, so let me keep slagging on LA a little bit, a little bit by actually starting by saying positive things about New York and Boston and San Francisco. What has New York built recently? Second Avenue Subway, right? Um, New York has built Second Avenue Subway. Uh, this is exactly the thing it should have been building. At very high cost? Absolutely. But it's the right project. Um, the 7 extension is not as good, to be fair. Uh, East Side X is not as good. Um, the gate, um, Second Avenue Subway Phase 2 right now is um, not under physical construction, but it's being designed already. Um, is that the next project the city should be building? Yes, this is a really good project. I wish it didn't cost you know, 10 times as much as it should, but this is a really good project. Like, if you're telling me, Alon, let's say that New York City has normal world construction costs, about $200 million a kilometer, maybe a little more in... Um, in, in the Manhattan core, less really far out. Alon, you got a billion and a half dollars to spend at this cost. Where do you spend it? Well, quite a lot of it is going to go to Second Avenue Subway Phase 2. It's a really good project. Okay. Um, what else is on the horizon? Uh, the Gateway Tunnel. Um, it's being done horrifically inefficiently, especially with um, extras that I wouldn't call betterments or extra scope that isn't actually necessary, like um, uh, they're trying to demolish this block south of Penn Station, block 780, and replace it with uh, and, and replace it with additional Penn Station tracks because they think that the 21 that the station has are not enough. That is stupid. Um, but the underlying project, the Hudson Tunnel project, so the gateway tunnel, extra tunnels here, yeah, this is exactly what they should be building. This is the right project. The right project at the wrong cost, but the right project. Um, um, the governor has made a, 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 her own personal project to build something called the Interborough Express, um, this kind of uh, orbital railway that you see here. Um, it's to carry, I, I think the plan is to do light rail. Um, again, I don't think they're doing a great, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to reserve judgment not saying they're awful at their jobs, but I'm seeing some big problems with how it's being done already. But this is the right project. This is a really good project. As I said, 1.5 billion, it's not enough to build Gateway even at normal cost. But yeah, Second Avenue Subway Phase 2. And after that, yeah, maybe 125th Street, which is being considered. Um, maybe IBX. Maybe a subway under Utica. Maybe a subway under Nostrum. But like all of these are really good projects at the wrong cost, but the right projects. Um, Something that New York does right, and I would like to give kudos where due. Um, Boston, um, same thing. Um, Green Line extension. Um, it's kind of the wrong way to build it because it should have been a regional rail project, but the alignment is good. Like, I mean, if you're telling me you can't touch commuter rail, um, which historically is how America rolls, um, and you ask me, Alon, where do you build uh, urban rail extension in Boston? I would say, yeah, um, Green Line extension here. Um, a Green Line extension through the historic Tremont Street subway uh, to replace the uh, Silver Line BRT, um, and then you maybe drag it as light rail all the way south to Mattapan. 
Uh, and yeah, these are the most important things. Um, and then if you are allowed to touch commuter rail, then regional rail, which in large part thanks to transit matters, is being pursued. As Again, they're not doing a good job of it, but it's the right project. San Francisco, it's a little different because the central subway is not the right project. Um, it's essentially a um, leakage because it was demanded by Chinatown activist Rose Punk. Um, the issue being that um, when the Embarcadero Freeway collapsed, this was a net boon to the city because it liberated the waterfront from the uh, from the highway, but neighborhood, but so it led to a large increase in property values along the waterfront, and it led to the redevelopment of much of the waterfront as um, as a recreational space. But neighborhoods that were near but not at the waterfront um, comparatively suffered, and this included Chinatown. Now, Chinatown is also very uh, is also the kind of um, small business run neighborhood where, where the sort of people who run the neighborhood drive. So they were so they wanted the Embarcadero freeway back, and when they realized they weren't going to get it, they wanted an alternative. The alternative being the Central Subway, which none of them is ever going to ride, but they want to be able to say we have it. Um, and likewise, the um, San Jose Subway is a terrible project, but that's not San Francisco. Um, but other but next to the but but after okay the wrong project in Central Subway, what are they looking at? Um, they're looking at maybe building a second. BART tube, which is difficult to build because of really high construction costs. Um, and then they're maybe going to drag it down Curie, which is exactly the right thing to do. Um, it's the right project, just at uh, high potentially project derailing costs. And then, in contrast with these relatively good examples, we have a bad one in LA. Does LA build good projects? Yes. LA does build the most. It, the LA is building the most important thing it should be building. This is um, um, not a cheap commuter for a moment. It is um, the Purple Line extension on Wilshire, most important bus corridor in in the region. Um, they're also doing run through tracks at Union Station for improving commuter rail. They're also gazing at electrification, but they're kind of slow about it. Um, but then beyond that, it's all bullshit. It's all like extensions upon extensions of light rail lines deep into suburbia, um, where they're not going to get a lot of ridership. They're often being built in freeway medians, um, which again, like the green line, nobody wants to wait there. Sometimes they're being built in um, legacy rights of way of Pacific Electric, which is better, but it's but to areas that don't have a lot of density to support that. Um, now, Los And now you might say, okay, no density, but um, you can redevelop. Well, LA is extremely NIMBY, um, so they're also not doing this kind of transit-oriented development. Um, moreover, all these measures, uh, measure R, measure M, they also include a lot of money that is not about transit expansion, but maybe about road repair, um, or about extra infusion of cash to bus operating um, funds, um, or um, or bridge repair, and it's there's so much leakage. I believe only 20% or 25% of the money in the ballot props in LA is used for master for for, for rail transit construction. Um, and again, most of that gets leaked to low grade projects. Like if you asked me in New York what I would build, again, you give me a budget and you say costs are normal, and it's things that are, um, and it's going to plausibly be what is currently being done. In LA, you ask me, and yeah, I'm going to say Purple Line um, to, to UCLA and even drag it all the way to Santa Monica, but then I would mention things that are um, on the far horizon for them, like a subway underneath um, Vermont, underneath South Vermont. Right now, the subway, I don't know if, the, if it's going to, yeah, you can see it. The It's one subway line, the rest are light rail, um, with two branches, one to Koreatown, that's the one that's being exp um, extended, that's the Purple Line, and then the red line diverge north to Hollywood under uh, Vermont. South Vermont would be to essentially turn this from a line with a branch to a cross system, to a, to a cruciform system, east, west, north, south. Um, Vermont being the second busiest uh, bus corridor in LA after Wilshire. Um, moreover, the third busiest is western, a mile away, um, a mile parallel. And so, um, this is something that is on the far horizon for them. That's so many things that they consider more important to build just to bribe individual communities so that they vote for them. They need two-thirds 
to win a vote on a ballot prop. LA is not sufficiently left green that they can say we're left we're progressives, we like mass transit for, for this the way they can in San Francisco. And so the um, so this is a situation in LA specifically, just a lot of leakage in addition to extremely high construction costs. So LA has very high construction costs, but it's also building but also spending a lot of money. It's just um, the money is not building much, not just because of the cost, but because most of it leaks to the wrong project. Now with roads, there's the same leakage problem, which is that American highway spending is extremely anti-developmental, always has been. It used to be anti-urban, um, and then by the time it was urban, it, w it ended up de facto being about suburban access to the city. Um, as America suburbanized and the suburbs became loci of economic production, um, yeah, freeways were being built there, but they were building increasingly in places that were declining rather than growing. This is the opposite of, let's say, Sweden, which is actually pretty good at um, directing road money as well as rail money to growing cities for developmental reasons. Um, and the United States is the exact opposite. Remember, Texas eats money toward Ohio. It should be the other way around. Resources should flow toward growth areas. Instead, the opposite is happening. And so making it easier to build um, mega projects in the United States might mean that some freeway tunnels are going to exist. But that's not where adverse model shift comes from. Um, adverse model shift comes from neglect, from lack of mass transit, much more so than from the presence of another freeway tunnel through city center. Remember, the freeway tunnel through city center reinforces city center. Yes, it creates adverse model shift because it means people are also going to drive more to city center, but often these people are going to drive anyway, and the alternative to driving to city center is them driving not to city center. And this doesn't mean that the freeways are good. The freeways are still a waste of money, but it's a waste of money that is not as adverse to model to to, to um to environmental goals as just neglect as the complete neglect of good public transit the, the, the part where america can spend 50 we're not america metro new york can spend 50 billion dollars on a five-year mta capital plan and have so little to show for it and um so, so that's the point about model about adverse model shift and finally i want to talk about the broader politics and the compromises so, politics is compromised, and this includes model compromises. So, what is the, and then, and then the, the question is just how you compromise on, and in what way. And this includes, and even choosing not to make compromises, it just means a different compromise. So, let's talk about the history a little bit. In Western Europe and in Japan, in the post war era, it was not viewed as a compromise. In retrospect, we can view it as a compromise now that model. Uh, warfare is a political issue, um, which was cars and trains are about. You build big things. This is the whole point of the view of the state in the middle of the 20th century, um, kind of the trad social democratic view, for example, or for that matter, the kind of center-right counter, which could be Christian democratic, or it could be um, in the Netherlands, it could be, or in Denmark, it could be right-wing liberal, or in France, it, they would just call it no dirigiste, which is a nice way of saying Christian democrats who no longer, who hate Muslims like all the other Christian Democrats, but no longer go to church. Um, and uh, so the idea is you build things. Um, I know Sweden, did, Sweden did it under a very left-wing government, right-wing government often did the same. The idea was that you would build freeways because cars are good, roads are good, big infrastructure is good, and you also build up the city. Um, you probably don't you probably don't build a high-rise central business district, or maybe even you do, um, in urban renewal zones like in Frankfurt. Again, not very common in Europe, but it did exist. It was also very common in the United States, um, city center skyscrapers. Um, you also built railways. Um, in post-war America, quite a lot of people still rode public transportation. I think most of them did so out of poverty, and as America got less poor, they all stopped. But there was still significant ridership. Western Europe was poor in the 1950s and 60s, and was the United States. There was more of that, and essentially, the ridership was retained, um, partly through less highway infrastructure, like um, through, let's say, uh, not having these four-level interchanges, or through having higher fuel taxes. But mostly, it's just the cities retained them through better urban alternatives, better urban services, including. 
mass transact. Um, and um, the um, and, and so this is cars and trains urbanism. Roads are going to be widened. Streets are going to be widened. Nobody cares about livability. You just build bigger. Like everything is bigger. I mean, I mean, I won't say everything is bigger in Texas or something, but Texas didn't do cars and trains. It is car. It is. It do, it didn't sell those cars and cars. Um, but it's kind of like that. But think about it also with trains. Um, this remains the view of let's say social democrats here. Um, SPD literally believes in cars and trains urbanism. It wants to expand freeways. Um, it also wants to expand the urban and the S-Bahn. It's also a pretty yimby party. Um, Olaf Scholz run on building 400,000 housing units in Germany a year, up from the current value or pre current value of 250,000. Um, within Berlin, SPD does want more housing. Um, it's compromising with other forces that don't, but this is the policy of SPD. Um, again, it, it, nowadays, because they don't care about livability, because everyone who cares about livability votes green. So now, as so I, I gave you the cars and trains example of uh, of a compromise, so let's talk about the other compromise, the new left compromise, the Jane Jacobs compromise, or the Green Party compromise. And that compromise, they don't think of themselves as compromising, but they talk about local action. What does local action mean? It essentially means, and, and this is something that probably most grew out of, let's say, 1970s, um, out of the 1970s Netherlands, um, where they didn't like how the city was being taken over by cars that were speeding, they were hitting people, like um, traffic accident deaths were pretty high. Um, and they essentially took away space from cars and gave it to bikes in the city center, um, leading to a lot of new right uh, reaction, new right literal, literal death threats against politicians. You would expect death threats would be against politicians for, I don't know, being Nazis, or not being Nazis if the people giving the death threats are the Nazis, uh, maybe communists, but no, this is literally just people, like, death-threatening politicians for taking space away from cars. Th this is how, this, this is windshield, right? And um, so, so they did that. Um, in, uh, I think there the might have been inspiration from Italy, um, certainly the Netherlands in the 1970s, when people said that this could be a good place to bike. People said, we can't be like that. We can't be like Italy. We're cold. At the time, Italy was much poorer than Northern Europe, so fewer cars, um, less suburbanization, less suburbanization of retail. Um, so um, people still lived in overcrowded housing in historic centers um, and, dro and drove if they could afford, but many couldn't and biked. Um, and, um, the, uh, and since then, Italy has... Motor. I mean, Italy converged with Northern Europe by the early 90s and then has since diverged again through um, kind of poor productivity growth since. But by now, everyone can afford a car. So kind, of, so kind of Italy grew back when growth meant more cars and then stagnated when growth meant more money for green infrastructure, um, making Italy kind of the car culture capital of Europe. Um, is it related to Italy's low construction costs, by the way? No, it absolutely isn't. Um, the low construction costs are a pretty recent thing. And um, they're, they're, a, uh, po they're essentially a post-anti-corruption reform uh, ph phenomenon. Um, and then Italy just couldn't build anything because of austerity. And now that Italy can afford to build more, things actually are improving, um, thanks to a combination of low costs and growing willingness to build. Um, but anyway, so in, in the Netherlands, um, they uh, took away space from cars and gave it to cyclists and pedestrians in city center. And this is something that spread um, all over, um, northern, uh, mostly northern Europe, but now we're seeing something called low traffic neighborhoods in the United Kingdom. In the United States, we're seeing some pedestrian plazas, bike lanes. Um, South Korea removed a freeway um, from city center, which turned the mayor into a superstar. He was then elected for president um, as a conservative candidate and wrecked the country, which reliably happens when South Korea elects conservatives. Um, and uh, the... Um, um, but the point is, but this was not really... So, so yeah, this was a change from the cars and trains paradigm in that the city was no longer supposed to be about cars. 
but yeah, most Dutch people know how to bike, but most Dutch people get to work by car. Most Danes get to work by car. So really the new left compromise, because it's so localist, because it's also about, all about local freeway revolts, because in New York, rich people like Jane Jacobs were capable of defeating freeways in their own neighborhoods. The Lower Manhattan Expressway thinks their activism was not built. By the way, I, I should point out, uh, the other freeway that was canceled, the Mid-Manhattan freeway, the one that um, was going to go like this, um, was also canceled. There was no freeway revolt here. It was just going to be too expensive to build through um, Midtown. Um, there was no money for tunnels, and uh, the elevated plan of Robert Moses was to build either around or through the Empire State Building. So, exactly as expensive as you would think. Um, but in poor neighborhoods, they did not have the ability to resist, because the whole point was to turn it into a matter of localism, and so the Cross Bronx was built wrecking the quality of life in the Bronx. Um, and accelerating already, uh, the already in evidence and created, but it accelerated the trend of white flight from the Bronx, making the Bronx the poorest urban county in the United States, I believe by 2000. Um, I believe it's no longer is, just because of relative changes, not even gentrification, just relative changes in the wealth of New York and other places, but the Bronx, I believe in, two, in 2000, the Bronx and El Paso tied for, or near tied for poorest urban county. And, uh, the, um, and so because it's a matter of localism, really, the, this kind of green agenda, and we, I'm seeing it in Berlin as well, it's um, to people or to pedestrians, city center, to cars everywhere else. And this is, again, it's people who think of themselves as not making compromises, but they are making a compromise. Localism is a compromise. The compromise is that, um, yeah, you're not going to complete this freeway here, thankfully, um, A100. It's being built. You might be able to tell that it's not being colored here because this is under construction. They're still building a freeway through fucking Neukölln in the 2010s, 2020s. Um, but a further expansion is being uh, delayed as an agreement between the Social Democrats and the Greens. The Social Democrats wanted to continue. The Greens didn't. The Greens stood on their, high le on their hind legs. It's not going to happen, thankfully. However, the Greens are also against U-Bahn expansion and S-Bahn expansion. They associate that with cars and trains urbanism. They associated that with removing streetcars for freeway, sorry, for, to, not to build freeway, to, build, to create more car space and maybe build, maybe bury some streetcar lines underground but and turn them into subways, but mostly it's for cars. And so they're, uh, and, and so Berlin is underbuilding the U-Bahn and the S-Bahn, and that is much more important for model shift um, than construction costs. Like, I mean, Berlin built this little section of urban freeway that was talking about before. That didn't lead to adverse model shift. It's just a small section of freeway. Much more important for model shift is that they comp is that they restored the ring. Um, they, at, the, at the same time, they were restoring the ex the pre war extent of the S bahn system, and since they've com they've completed U five through city center under Utrecht and Linden, as I said, very complex construction, and uh, the, and this is much more important. And um, being able to build, uh, I shouldn't even be built, able. Berlin has low enough construction costs. It's actually, it, it absolutely can do things like build U A to Mackesches Viertel. It just keeps choosing not to because of this, these compromises that um, kind of shift funding in the wrong way. So yeah, they're building streetcar extensions through city center so that people who are already not going to drive are going to continue not driving, which they wouldn't have driven either way. Um, the uh, kind of gadfly-ish um, transport economist, John Adams, let's say, transport. I don't want the company. Maybe he's an economist or... Um, yeah, this guy um, keeps mocking how... Uh, the, so this was already something he was writing 20 years ago, maybe, um, when Blair was the prime minister. He said that the, uh, he pointed out that the British government was saying that they're not against cars, but they wish that people left them at the garage more. And then he talks, okay, but why are, why are they slowing down traffic um, where it's already slow? Why are they doing all of this in city centers where already people drive out of masochism um, and not slowing down cars outside cities? Um 
and and it's the same issue. Like I mean, the adverse model shift is not gonna um it, it's not gonna come from being able to build more infrastructure because in the cities, which is where you might see a, a, a freeway tunnel, or in Stockholm you will see a freeway tunnel, unfortunately. But yeah, that, that's gonna be a problem. But but it's good when you're building a large slew of urban rail extensions in Stockholm, the um, uh, so city bonen and new tunnel bonen, and and I actually worry that um, a lot of transit activists in the United States are not willing to take this trade and are not willing to say, okay, you get your fairway tunnel, but we get our mass transit tunnel. Um, there was, for example, a lot of uh, opposition to um, permitting reform, uh, which. I think just failed to clear a filibuster in the United States, but there was a um, there was a big deal for Senator Joe Manchin. He wanted permitting reform to build some. I think I'm forgetting whether it was I don't think it was called. I think it was an oil, a gas pipeline, but with the understanding that most of the projects that would be built thanks to permitting reform would actually be solar power or, or wind power, um, which are also subject to the same nimbyism. Uh, by the way. Bavaria in, in Germany. So, so that's, that, that's America, but in Germany, Bavaria is horrifically nimby against wind power. No wind power could be built in Germany if the rest of Germany had Bavaria's nimby laws um, against wind power. And um, um, and likewise, when the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed, it increased transport funding, and it even led to a positive model change in the formula. Typically, it's... Um, Four to one, eighty to twenty, eighty percent cars, twenty percent mass transit in the United States, and um, through all the shifts um, with the BIL, it was two to one instead of four to one. Quite a lot of activists still called it a highway bill, and a lot of transport activists were against it, even though it was a big increase in public transportation funding, because essentially these are all like I don't want to say children of the seventies; these were people of all ages, but these are people who are like intellectually still thinking of the new left compromise of um, to put a, to the people, city center, to the cars, everything else. Um, these are also people who think of the um, desirability of workable cities and, and mass transit in purely consumptive terms, part of the new left, it's consumption-oriented urbanism, um, where they talk constantly about how nice touristy places are transit-oriented, that people travel for tourism to New York and London and Paris and not to Suburban Texas, okay, sure. They also travel for tourism to Vegas and Disney World um, and to Bangkok. Um, I think Bangkok before Corona was the top city in the... Yeah, David, yeah, that example. I mean, yeah, David Harvey, is, like in general, like the academic urbanist left... I shouldn't say I'm going to the Academic urbanists often are like that kind of um, new left, very consumption theoretic... People and now consumption theory is descriptive, so it's a it's an it's a false it's an incorrect description of why people move to cities, and as and, and I'm giving you an example of people having this incorrect description when they talk about walkability as uh, as something the tourists like. Well, yeah, tourists like being able to walk around. Tourists also like having an obsequious service staff, ideally from a slightly different culture, so that they can. Uh, can think about it differently from their own country's working classes, which is, I think, why Bangkok, well, why Thailand is such a popular tourist destination. Um, oh, what? Okay, that I did not hear about. I mean, I do, so for the record, I also, I, I've heard this about people who are very production theoretic as well. Like, I mean, asshole's gonna asshole, I will say. Like, it's not the theory is bad. I mean, the theory is bad, but not because this guy... May, maybe having Me Too problems, which to be very clear, I'm just basing this on what you said. I don't know if he's had any. If you have links, I would be very interested. But anyway, so people are talking, but now I will talk about this in terms of production theory, not consumption theory. In the United States, what are the wealthiest cities? Um, let's even say wealthiest cities stripping away the income of the landlords. Oh, okay, just an asshole. Okay. Um, okay. So it's. Uh, in in the United States, the wealthiest city regions are, well, San Francisco because of tech, New York, Boston, Washington, Seattle. Have you noticed something about them? This is like, I'm, I'm literally listening to you, I think five of the top eight regions in the United States in public transportation model split. I think it's these five plus 
Chicago, Honolulu, and Philadelphia. Um, and um, and Philadelphia might actually be below Seattle, so it's five out of the top seven. Um, and, and Honolulu might even be behind Seattle, so it might be five of the top six. I don't remember. Um, so why? Well, uh, and so why? Well, um, okay. Part of it is just a city center thing. City center is going to be more transit oriented and also richer. Um, compare, for example, Chicago with most of the rest of the Midwest. But, I mean, there's a reason. The reason is that public transportation lets you access a large, economically diverse city center. When I say economically diverse, I don't mean many different industries. New York has a bunch of different industries, but it's not, like... But, but is there some industries, there are more equal than others, and the same is true of San Francisco. No, what I mean is that you can have, this, um, you can have more of the office supply chain there um, if you don't have enough city center space or if, like things are too suburbanized, usually what's going to happen is that city center is going to be the highest end jobs and they're going to throw away the back office functions either to the suburbs. Um, for example, in Boston, um, Moderna is headquartered in Kendall Square, but a lot of their labs are elsewhere in the region. I think there are a bunch in, uh, um, around like Dedham, Norwood, like that area, like this area. And um, so it's going to be less efficient this way, uh, especially if people can't travel between these as easily. And, uh, um, or they might um, outsource some places to poorer regions. Uh, and this is a, this is an economic drag. And this is, and this is a reason why, and, and this I think is the reason why Houston and Dallas have not been able to generate the economic productivity of the Northeast uh, or San Francisco, um, it's a real problem. So this is a production, this is an entirely production theoretic story, and uh, the uh, and, and it's something where all of this matters. It matters being able to build more infrastructure. It matters if you can, and again, people do care. Um, even in Texas, even in Texas, highways that are too expensive sometimes get canceled. Um, and maybe you, you don't care. Again, I don't care. But it's indicative of other things. For example, trains not being able to be built, which do lead to economic problems. And again, it's not just the city is going to be less nice. It's not just quality of life. It's actual economic production suffers due to this. Um, I'm going to stop here and ask if people have questions. Uh not about David Harvey because we're mostly not talking about David Harvey. We're mostly talk. We we're mo we're mostly talking about cars and road construction costs and why. I mean, it matters that you can't build them. That you can't build as many roads, but it doesn't actually lead to address model shift again. If you if you fix your procurement, you're also building the alternatives much better in the same way that yeah, maybe you're building a gas pipeline, but yeah, you're also turning the United States from a country where solar power is an afterthought. And wind power is an afterthought to a country with like German levels of um, wind and solar. Like that, you should take that trade. Um, is something that I wish more American environmentalists understood. Um, I want to say European environmentalists too. Some of them get that, some don't. Um, the Greens are actually better about these compromises. Usually, like in Berlin, actually, there was a compromise about building more housing between the EMBR SPD and the EMBR Greens, um, which would build. Less housing than the, than the city should, but a not terrible amount of housing. And then d -Link came in and wrecked it, because d -Link, uh, in addition to being a pro-Putin party, just like wrecking things. Japan and East Asia. Yeah, Japan and East Asia, yes. Um, this is post-war. Um, this is post-war cars and trains urbanism. Um, absolutely, I think. Singapore still has it. Singapore essentially maintains model shift through... Um, uh, very high taxes on cars, so pure stick. And the upshot is that in Singapore, everyone who can afford a car gets one. It's just not a lot of people can afford a car. Um, I know in Hong Kong, it's actually led to deterioration in the model shift because there's kind of this constant demand from the broad upper middle class now that they have cars to make the city more auto-oriented to serve them. And um, in Hong Kong, this was maybe before, this was maybe Hong Kong 2010s, so the upper middle class was informally a power center. In Singapore, it's much, it's less so because Singapore is much more absolutist about this, but um, 
that that's not going to hold forever. And this is a problem. Um, South Korea uh, did remove the freeway. South Korea, I don't know if South Korea is building a freeway as it, building freeways is removing. Um, Metro Seoul, by the way, has a lower model split. I don't want to say now because Corona, but on the eve of Corona, it had a lower model split than maybe 10 or 20 years before. I don't remember, but um, it was down by a very small amount. And it's actually a really good thing. Um, not that the model split fell, but it fell so little because South Korea is a newly industrialized country. It's still much poorer than most of the rest of the first world. I mean, converging very rapidly, but it's converging from somewhere below. So more people are capable of uh, affording a car and driving. And the fact that in Seoul, yeah, they've had slight deterioration in model split due to suburbanization, but very little due to, I mean, TOD. And within the city itself, it's actually, the model split is improving. It's just in the suburbs, it's, there's just not shift with the suburbs. Um, and and the, as the city is getting so much richer, um, it's still maintaining a transit model, but I think they, they were maybe 52%. I don't remember the exact figures. I remember that the latest figure was 50% um, trip to work model split in the combo of either Seoul and uh, uh, and Gyeonggi or Seoul and Gyeonggi and Incheon. I think it's all three. Incheon or no Incheon would not make a big difference. Incheon is like one eighth of the region or one seventh of the region. And uh, it, I believe it's a deterioration from maybe 51 or 52% a decade before, which, yeah, it's a deterioration, but it's an area where incomes are increasing rapidly and to, at exactly the level where, people, where mass car ownership becomes more and more appealing, and yet there's barely any adverse model shift. Why? Because South Korean construction costs are the lowest in Asia, literally the nearest country to South Korea with similarly low construction costs is Turkey. Um, I wish South Korea could have been among our cases. I wish we had more resources to um, hire someone who is an ex who is like Korean or an or, or an expert on Korea, and write that as another low cost case. Although to be honest, if we had money for one or two more cases, it would not have been South Korea. Probably would have been mid cost, so Germany, France, or Japan, um, and maybe then South Korea. But that would have been a really interesting thing to study just because certain because for example South Korea builds bigger stations than do low cost European countries. Um, but the point is that South Korea has been able to maintain high model split with very little deterioration at an income growth level where usually that's when mass transit ridership collapses entirely and where is Seoul? Fifty percent. And yeah, or fifty percent, not sorry. I shouldn't say where is Seoul fifty percent. Where is Seoul with all of its rapidly growing suburbs in Gyeonggi and Incheon? Where is that? Half the country? 50%. Why? Because, yes, they removed a freeway, but much more importantly than the removal of a freeway, they do mass TOD in those growing suburbs. The um, housing is being built near where the trains go. And the trains are expanding at, break, at breakneck pace. And I apologize if I am mispronouncing the word breakneck. Is it, should it, is it breakneck? Breakneck? Why is this language pronounced like it was like like the people who spell it are all drunk? Anyway, um, let me get rid of my face for a moment. Yeah, there are, there are foundations for this. I mean, in Japan, you can learn from Jerry's. But, um, uh, but anyway, Seoul 20 years ago, Seoul today, I mean, two years ago. Yeah, they keep building all these things. And 2000 was itself rapid growth from before. I mean, I imagine there was deterioration in the model split from 1980 to 2000 because in 1980 the country was poor. But, um, like in the, but as it got less poor in the 90s, uh, so around this time the country becomes uh, the world leader in broadband. Uh, and at the time, people still can't always afford a computer at home, so they go play at, uh, or they can't afford good internet connection at home, so they go play at uh, these LAN cafes, and as a result, uh, become the world leader in the rapidly rising game of StarCraft and in the new invention of esports. And uh, yeah, very rapid growth. It's still continuing, thanks to their very low costs. This is important. Mass transit construction, it's kind of a weird situation where 
reducing subway construction costs, you can see how it's going to lead to model shift. Um, how you can see big model shift, um, or in places that should be seeing adverse model shift, lack of model shift at all, like Korea, um, in places that are capable of building, um, places that are capable of building, maybe, uh, or, or in Canada, same thing. Um, Calgary had very good model shift. Calgary in the 1990s and early 2000s as it built the C train at very low cost, but that was just the first three lines. The fourth line costs so much that they can't build as much anymore, so their model shift is stuck. I don't know what their model shift, what the model split is in 2021, and probably is a deterioration because Corona made all the transit using office workers stay at home, but um, by 26, 2016, I think, was the same as 2011 and 2006 in Calgary. Vancouver has maintained good model shift through being able to build more, but that's rapidly going to run out after they complete Broadway. Um, their construction costs are rising to the point that it's hard to build more there. Um, so essentially when they run out of the current lines and then TOD there, which there's still a lot of space for, it's going to be a problem. Toronto has its problem. Toronto, um, I don't think Toronto ever had good model, ever had positive model shift. Um, Toronto had maintenance of, well, to some extent, maintenance of model share when they, uh, and, and you're going to, and Porter's asking me about a uh, bus wage cost spiral. I actually don't know about substituting trains for buses. I don't actually know how rail bus substitution works in South Korea. I barely know how it works in Singapore, and they live there. All I know is in Singapore, there was a policy of doing so, um, of moving people from buses to trains, and they realized, wait, we're also charging more for the trains for the than for the buses. Okay, let's fix that. Um, in Toronto, they um, had before the bus operator wage spiral, so in the 1960s, they had lots of bus service, and then um, the Young subway line, and then they built the second one, um, the, the, Bloor, the Bloor Danforth one, and this let them maintain more of a downtown and more of a model split, but they haven't really been able to grow it because the RER project is stalling because North American commuter rail, and uh, the relief line, it's currently called the Ontario line because it's been proposed and cancelled so many times that um, always due to very high costs that they couldn't build it. And because of that, it's harder to grow jobs in city centre. And it's harder um, to do model shift in Toronto. And this is why Toronto, um, which might have been the like number three or four city in the Anglosphere in model split, like it's like London, like like in the modern era, it's always been London, then New York. Um, I think at this point, Sydney is number three and then Toronto. Um, but Vancouver is actually closing in on Toronto pretty fast. Uh, but um, like it's probably like, like 20 or 25 years ago, I think Toronto was even ahead of Sydney. And um, so you need to be able to build in order to affect model shift. And it's kind of weird that on the one hand this, but on the other hand, if you can't build freeways the way that in the United States they can't build I-69 and they can't build all these freeway tunnels, that does not make it impossible for you to do adverse model shift because adverse model shift can come from rather local roads that are being upgraded very locally and very incrementally um, by the demands of the local notables, like the, the local business owners who drive on them all the time. and. Uh, and can even pursue uh, and can even conceive this as for them, and um, uh, and just keep de-urbanizing, which is what happen is happening in the United States. Um, people moving to areas, yeah, sometimes because these are rich, like Texas. Texas maybe is poorer than the Northeast or California, but it's richer than most of the rest of the United States. But then they're moving to retirement special communities like Florida, to retirement specific communities like Florida, or they're moving from California to. Arizona and Nevada, which are both much poorer, um, this is de-urbanization. This is a push model, and this is so. This is partly about NIMBYism, but it's also about inability to build supportive transportation, which is again not going to be cars. Cars are not that relevant either way. It's mostly public transit to these very wealthy, um, very productive. Jobs and since I'm saying wealthy, I don't mean just rich people live there. I mean like a lot of economic production happens there. So I mean the Bay Area writ large. I mean the New York region writ large. Um, so yeah, so I can't answer anyway. I can't answer your question about all about this because I don't know. Um, and again, do people have other questions? Um, 
sorry, I'm being bombarded with messages that uh, I uh, did not want to that I did not want to get to while I was um, monologuing on stream. Um, I'm gonna um, ask again if there are uh, other questions. Uh, if there aren't, we can end this. It's been, so I almost had a meeting that required me to stop after 50 minutes. I, uh, as you can see, don't have a meeting. The meeting happened before. Uh, just because people keep asking about updates about the construct about the transit cost project, we were finalizing a graphic uh, showcasing the New York cost premium, uh, which will likely lead to the publication of the project. I think this week, um, which suggests that Saturday stream, if there's any demand for it, will be potentially better. Um, so, um, know that even when I talk about cars, I like talking about trains more because I'm a train person, which is also why, generally, for us, for trained people, we know the politics of trains much better than the politics of cars. We know the obstacles to trains much more than those toward cars. Um, and it's very easy to like round, oh, I don't know much about these obstacles, but these obstacles don't exist. And this is, again, where you're seeing people, where we're seeing left-wing people in the United States claim, unironically, that high military costs never led to the cancellation of big projects, where they absolutely do. Um, but you never hear about the ones that are being canceled, because usually, I mean, because maybe they're less flashy than the ones that uh, stay continuing previous conversation. What do you mean? Oh, you went in the beginning before I started recording um, about depot placement. Um, again, I don't know. I mean, about uh, oh, where rail yards should be. Um, usually, they're in historic sites. Usually, rail yards are overbuilt in a rich country. Certainly, they're overbuilt in your specific country. Um, just knowing what your country's uh, railway network was. Uh, I mean, at one point, there were more railways in your country than not in your country. For example when it had just invented the railway in 1830, uh, or generally in the 1830s and 40s. But um, the, um, so in like a newly developed railway system, I don't know, like, I don't know what I would advise India or China on this. Um, I'm pretty sure that nowhere in Western Europe or honestly, or Eastern Europe or the United States do they need net expansion of rail yards. They might need to move, like, I mean, maybe if you're building a lot of cross type projects, you might need um, yards for them. Like if New York does a lot of regional rail, it might need to find yard space in, uh, in your suburban ends of lines, uh, which thankfully is gonna become easier because if you build cross rail type projects, then you can, uh, then you can more efficiently get to the right, to, to the easier side of the metro area for this. Um, this absolutely is a calculation. Um, you might need to move, I mean, if you have congestion like for freight around Chicago, uh, you might need to move some yards, but I don't think you need net expansion, um, which is why it's been so easy to slowly claw back these goods yards and, uh, uh, and, and generally these rail yards um, to do a lot of urban renewal on top of rail yards in London and Paris. Um, less so in American cities because American cities um, got more efficient earlier through um, Union stations, uh, and uh, then they stayed at, the, at that level of efficiency, whereas I think in Europe they stayed inefficient longer and then got more efficient in a later stage through rationalization. Um, but um, the uh, but but so in uh, but but certainly, certainly New York. I mean, but the closest example of this is when they built, when, when they're developing over the rail yards, things like Hudson Yards, um, or much of Midtown East over the um, Grand Central tracks, um, or honestly the High Line. I, I like, I hope the answer is right. The answer, I mean, the answer is where, I mean, again, probably old locations, but also you can call them back. Um, like, I don't think you need to, like, I don't think you usually need to build new big ones. Um, usually, again, they're overbuilt because they were built in the steam era. 
if that makes sense. Um, I don't think so. Um, again, if you're expanding one specific service, like, I don't know, like, maybe High Speed 2 needs new rail yards, I don't actually know. Um, but, um, the, but certainly, like, Crossrail 2, I don't think, should need a new rail yard. Like, I, I imagine London already has many, um, that can be used. Um, in New York, um, my understanding is that they don't actually need yeah, I don't, again, I don't know, like, may, I don't know if they're moving them or, or for what, so, I, um, but, again, my understanding is that, historically, um, they were overbuilt, it's possible that London, um, clawed back too much, I don't know, um, I don't think Paris needs more, um, and Paris is expanding the area. Um, anyway, are there other questions, because this is something that I, we could talk about another time? Um, do other people have questions? Sure, no problem. Oh, thanks for watching. And I will see you... Again, I don't know if there's going to be demand for a stream when you guys will celebrate Christmas, actually celebrate Christmas. Uh, we will see... We'll also see what the topic is, but anyway, thank you and uh, ciao, ciao.